My name is Flash Isaac and I'm a teacher from the future. You're welcome to episode number 72 of the 120 Days to Jam Physics with Flash Isaac. In this episode, we shall be looking at electrostatics. In the next episode, we shall be looking at the electric field. While in the next two episodes, we shall be answering questions under both electrostatics and electric field. Ladies and gentlemen, electrostatics. Electrostatics. Now you see that electrostatics is basically from two ways. Yeah. Electro. Electro. Which means electric or electric charge and statics. Statics. Statics mean there is no motion. Statics mean there is stability. Statics mean equilibrium has been reached. Which means the whole idea of electrostatics is electric charge that is not in motion. Electric charge at rest or with very little motion. So what is this electric charge? To understand what I am about to share with you, let's go back to chemistry. We discuss atoms as the unit of matter. And we say that atoms are very reactive, they are unstable, they hardly exist independently. So, these atoms, they prefer to exist in a stable or independent state, referred to as molecule. If this is chlorine, this is chlorine atom. Now, mostly, you will not see chlorine like this, sitting as an atom, no. It refers to be in a stable state. So, chlorine will uh, join itself to form something like this. Cl2. This is why most times we see chlorine in this way as molecule. Hydrogen atom H2. This is hydrogen molecule. Let's draw something like this. Something like this. The structure of the atom comprises what we refer to as the nucleus, the shell. Proton, neutron, and electron. Now, this nucleus is where the mass of the atom is concentrated. Now, the nucleus is basically comprised of proton plus neutron. This is why the atomic mass of any atom is the sum of proton and neutron, and it is concentrated in the nucleus. Proton, in terms of charge, is positively charged. We are dealing with electric charge. By the way, what is an electric charge? Electric charge is defined as the property of subatomic particles that causes them to experience a force when placed in magnetic field or electromagnetic field. So, charge is the basic property of subatomic particles. Particles. Now, what are the subatomic particles? They are electron, proton, and neutron. So, there is this property of subatomic particles that will cause them to experience force when placed in electric uh, electromagnetic field. They experience they to experience this movement that causes them to experience this push. And this uh, charge, electric charge, can be positive or negative. It can be plus or minus. The plus charge is referred to as positive charge. The minus charge is referred to as negative charge. So now, this proton is in the nucleus. Proton is a positively charged subatomic particle. And this neutron is neutral. It does not possess any charge. So, we've talked about the nucleus. Then, this electron you see does not stay inside the nucleus. Electron revolves around. And mind you, when you hear electricity, electric current, or whatever, 
It is electrons that contribute to that. The movement of electrons, the flow of electrons, that is what brings about electricity or electric current. So, if this is the closest shell to the nucleus, this has two electrons. The next eight electrons. Now look at it closely. Electrons are negatively charged and protons are positively charged. So you have all this in an atom. Sometimes, or let's say, if I say Na, in chemistry, this is sodium. And that should be the 11th element, atomic number of 11. Now, this should be something like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, this should be a sodium atom, 11 electrons. No, the number of an atom or the atomic number is the number of protons that atom has. The number of protons. That is the atomic number. Now, if you have Na like this, without charge on top, it means this sodium is neutral. Now, what makes an atom neutral? An atom is neutral when the number of protons and electrons are equal. If the charge on electron and proton are equal, the atom will become neutral. Let's look at it this way. If for an atom, you have 11 protons and you have 11 electrons, you see that the proton plus 11 and the electron minus 11, they will cancel out. If you are only 11 naira, you are only somebody 11 naira, that is minus 11, then you do a small job and they pay you 11. That is plus 11. So what do you do? You say, let me clear my debt. Since what you have is equal to what you are owning, that means you are left with zero, you are neutral. You neither have and you neither owe. So that is the same for atom. If the number of electrons equal the number of protons, the atom will become neutral. But something happens. If this sodium decides to say that, I look so beautiful, look at electrons here, what is this one doing on top here? It's spoiling my beauty. And decide to release it or to donate it, it is no longer neutral. Now, it is no longer an atom. It becomes an ion. Ions are uh, atoms or group of atoms that possess charge. So when an atom gives out electron, it becomes positively charged. And the number of the electron it gives out determines the charge. So this has one electron. If so don't give this out, it becomes plus one, or it just simply says plus. So here it is no longer neutral. The number of protons is now more than electron, so it is positive. For an atom with more electrons than proton, the one that will receive electron, it will now have more electron than proton, it becomes negatively charged. So charges exist when these atoms lose or gain electron. And it is these charges that are responsible for electricity or electric or current. And electric charge electrostatics, Coulomb's law and electromagnetism especially are major parts or core parts of physics. I'm telling you this as an electrical and electronic engineering graduate. I gained admission. That was 2014. Yes. So let's see something. If I give you, let's say, plastic rod plus seal or a rod of glass. No, if I give you a plastic rod plus four or a rod of glass, let's say glass rod plus sick. Sick. So if a plastic rod is rubbed with four or glass rod, or some people will see, I think ebonite rod, rubbed with sick. By the time they get rubbed, this will have the ability to attract thin sheet of paper. Even comb, when you rub comb closing on your hair, it gets charged and it can even attract the thin pieces of paper. So these are examples of electrostatics. That is how this works. So now, for plastic rod being rubbed with four, the charge here is negative charge. For a 
carbonite rod rubbed its lip, it is positively charged. And the study of positive and negative charge or, or electrostatic generally is being promoted by Coulomb. Coulomb. This is why to understand electrostatics, you must understand the Coulomb law. Coulomb basically have two top laws when it comes to electrostatics. Coulomb's first law of electrostatics states that like charges repair while unlike charges attract. We said that we have positive and negative charges. Now, if you bring two positive charges together, plus plus, they will repel. If you bring two negative charges together, or, or materials possessing two negative charges, they will repel. Mean as you are drawing them closer, they will try to shift. They will try to shift. They will try to shift. Now, what happens when you bring opposite charge? like the plus and minus these are unlike charges different charges so they will attract if this is plus and this is minus as you are bringing them together they will try to go on because they are opposite charges that is law first law of Coulomb. how about the second law of Coulomb? Coulomb's second law says that the force of attraction if they are on, on light charges or the force of repulsion if they are light charges between two charges is proportional to the products of their charges and inversely proportional to the square of their distance apart. Columns lost this that the force of attraction or repulsion between two point charges is directly proportional to the product of their charges and inversely proportional to the square of their distance apart. Now, this is a limitation of Coulomb's law. It only applies to point charges. What are point charges? It means uh, two small, small charges with big distance apart. So, if you have two charges, the force of attraction between these two charges, and mind you, Electric charge is measured in Coulomb. So Q is measured in Coulomb. And the unit, the unit is big C, capital C, that is the unit for Coulomb. And the symbol is Q, big Q. This is saying that if you have two charges, the force of attraction or repulsion between these two charges is directly proportional to the product of their charges, which means the charge of the first one times the charge of the second one. Let's put it this way. If you have two point charges, let's say one is Q1, uh, two Coulomb. Another charge, we will call that one, let's say Q2, is equals one Coulomb. So the force of attraction between these two is proportional to, instead of saying big Q and small Q, let's just say, let big Q be Q1, like the first charge, small, the other Q2 be small Q, the, the second small charge that is q1 q2 over d here or you can also say arrow square so anything you put here d or arrow it just basically represents uh, distance square now in mathematics we do not solve with proportionality sign when there is proportionality sign we know that a constant will come in i explain this in variation look at that video you will find something interesting. My variation in the series. So, this is F is equals K Q1 Q2 over arrow square or D square equals K Q1 Q2 over D square. Just know that this is their distance of separation. What is Q? No, what is K? K refers to Coulomb's constant 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 and this k has its own formula or a way of finding it the Coulomb constant k is equals 1 over 
four i epsilon naught. Now this epsilon naught or epsilon refers to permissivity, or just epsilon refers to relative permissivity. Now this epsilon naught is permissivity in free space. So if we are dealing with permissivity in free space, one over four pi epsilon naught, we take the Coulomb constant to be nine times ten to the power nine in meter square per Coulomb square. Newton meter square per Coulomb square. This is due, this will be the uh, constant. Most times they will say take k to be this. But for uh, the advanced exams, when you are not given the value of k and you are given, you either be given e naught or you be given e r or you be given e m. So a piece of naught in free space is eight point eight five four times minus power minus two of Coulomb square per Newton per meter square. Now, this e arrow, e small arrow under, is relative permissivity. Why this is permissivity in medium? Let's say we are dealing with, um, okay, let's say uh, A, for example. If you are given relative permissivity, it is the same thing as permissivity in medium over permissivity in free space. This is the relationship between relative permissivity, permissivity in medium, and permissivity in Free space. So we know this already. If you are given that of medium, you can easily find relative permissivity. Don't worry, by the time we start solving questions, you will see more of these use cases. I just want to introduce it to you here. I told you in the next two episodes, we will look at uh, questions. Most times, you will be given the value of k. Take k to be this. You won't need to bother. But I don't teach you based on they will do this or they will not do that. No, I teach you to standard. For you to know and to be ready for any condition that comes. Now, what else? Let's look at this. Now, we shall look at our uh, charging of bodies. This can be done by friction, by contact, or by induction. What are the types of charges uh, produced by contact, by friction, or by induction? And how do we charge a single body by induction or two bodies by induction? We shall look at all these shortly. Before then, let me use these diagrams to explain certain things you need to know when it comes to electrostatics because I do not want to leave any stone unturned. Now, if you've ever heard of uh, the pit balls, you may be wondering what are the principles of this uh, pit ball? First of all, let's see the attraction and repulsion of charges with pit balls. When two pit balls are placed closely to each other, are touched by a charge rod, you place two charge or uh, two pit balls together, as you can see, and they are being touched by a charge rod. They will be charged by contacts and become attracted at first. The balls will later repair each other due to the same charge in them thereby jumping towards the road. The bus will also be repaired by the road because of the same reason, thereby jumping back. Hence, ball jump up and down rapidly for a short time between the road and the bench until the road loses its charge. In this case, it will no longer bounce. The charge has been lost. And there is something called distribution or concentration of charges. Charges are mostly concentrated around sharp points and the outermost part of hollow conductor. Then charges can also be transferred. So for transfer of charges, when you take a sample of charges from one place to another, we say it has been transferred. This is done by proof plane. This proof plane is a spherical metal fastened to an insulating handle. It takes sample by contact or by conduction. Now, charges, talking about charges, charges can be de detected using what we refer to as electroscope. It is used to detect charges. Now, how does this work? The electroscope for detecting charges. Now, look at detection. We are talking about electroscope right now, as you can see. Knowing whether a body is charged or not is called detection of charges. 
So this is carried out by rolling the body on the cap of an electroscope so that the leaf, usually made up of gold or aluminium, can diverge or open. This is why we say gold leaf electroscope. Now to test these charges, we mean we are trying to know the sign whether the charge is positive or negative. So this is done with a charged electroscope. The sign is known from the result produced when a charged body is rolled on the cap of the charged electroscope. So increase in divergence is seen with similar charges for in an electroscope, while decrease in divergence is seen in opposite charges or an uncharged and a charged body. This is why Increase in divergence is regarded as the true test of sign. Other uses of electroscope are comparing of relatively magnitude of charges, comparing insulating property of different materials, measurement of potential difference, and ionization current in air. So for good conductor, there will be rapid collapse. For poor conductor, there will be no collapse because no leakage of charges. And for good insulator, there will be slow collapse. Of the good leaf electroscope. And there's something called radioactive source and good leaf electroscope. Radioactive source. Don't forget that radioactivity is the spontaneous disintegration of the nucleus of an element, thereby producing radiations. So these radiations can be alpha radiation, beta radiations, or gamma rays. Temperature, almost external factors, they do not affect this rate of radiation. So, how does radioactive materials and the electroscope come in contact? What should you know about that? Radioactive materials, gold leaf, electroscope. Alpha particles are relatively heavy and have considerably energy. So, when they collide with atoms or molecules, they knock out electrons from them. As alpha particles move in air, ions and electrons are produced. Then, when an alpha particle is brought close to the cap of a gold leaf electroscope, which has the positive or negative charge, the leaf falls slowly as ions of opposite sign to the charge are attracted to the cap. But there is no, there is no effect seen when beta and gamma rays are used because they produce much less ionization. Alpha particles are the most ionizing. Now look at it. Of decrease and increase in divergence in an electroscope. Opposite charge charges brought from different heights and at a far distance there is decrease in divergence and at a lesser height increase in divergence. Something else is very important. Storing of charges. Storing of charges. Storing of charges. Which means we are looking at electrostatic machines and generators. So, what should you know about storing of charges? As a machine, quantities of charges produced are considered as a generator. It converts mechanical energy to electrical energy. And we have the friction type, induction type, and the electrophorus, which is one kind. For friction type, it is non-satisfactory for storing. For induction type, it is of two kinds which is wim host machine. For electrophorus, it is of one kind, which means simple electrophorus can be used to produce, transfer, or store charges. There's something called Van de Graaff machine. This is a highly efficient machine that works on different principles for producing electromagnetic force. The quantity of charge produced depends on the size of the machine, efficiency of insulation, and humidity of air. It is used to study atomic structure. Now, discharging to discharge, this is referred to as the removal of charges from a charged body. Discharging can be done by flame ionization, atmospheric or atmospheric ionization, and also by point action. How are discharging applicable? Charging of bodies and removing of charge. Discharging of bodies have certain effects. One of them is lightly. So let's generally look at discharging of bodies. Material used for preventing. Okay, let's look at this application of discharging. 
Lighting and lighting conductors are application of discharging. Lightning and lightning conductors. Lightning is a dendritic electric spark produced due to discharge between two charged clouds or between a charged cloud and the earth. The process of is summarized below the process of lightning. A moving cloud becomes electrically charged by friction. A charged cloud induces opposite charge in tall objects on the earth like trees and buildings. Now this air ionizes and the charged air models molecules opposite to the cloud move upward to attract it while the charged air molecules of the same charge are repaired to the earth with great heat release. And for lightning conductor, material used for presenting li lightning are iron rod with spikes at the top or copper strips. The discharge from the spikes pass down the conductor to the earth. The discharge cloud could be electrons if the cloud is negatively charged or positive charge if the cloud is positively charged. If the cloud is negatively charged, positive ions in air will be repaired upwards towards the cloud from the tip of the lightning conductor. I'm talking about conduction of electricity or looking at electric force between two charged bodies, which shall be dealt with soon. You should know that for solids, the charge carriers are electrons. These are charge carriers for solids. For liquids, ions are charge carriers. So when you hear ions or ionizes, we are talking about electrons, like in we are talking about liquid. Since electrons are charge carriers in solids, ions are charge carriers in liquid. Flow of charge is by ions in liquids. For gases, charges are carried by electrons and ions. Charging by friction. This produces charges of opposite kinds from two uncharged bodies due to exchange of electrons of equal magnitude and this is usually applicable for insulators and conductors. By contact, this produces charges of the same kind due to conduction of charges from the charged body to the uncharged body. This is usually for conductors. Now take note that charging by friction produces charges of opposite kinds. This means to produce charge of opposite kinds, we apply friction relative motion. Now by contact produces charges of the same kind and this is due to conduction. So charges by contact is due to conduction and charges by friction is due to exchange of electrons. So for these opposite kinds of charges, for contact the same kinds of charges and by induction this can produce charges of opposite kinds and it is due to charge body present and of equal magnitude. This is usually for conductors only, for conductors only, for insulators and conductors. Now, charging by induction, let's see how do we charge a single body by induction. These are the steps. One, to charge a single body by induction, you start with inducing charge of opposite kind. Two, you distribute two opposite charge charges around the body. 3. You add the charge, that is, touching with finger and removing. 4. You add a charge rod, which means you are inducing the charge. So, charge rod is being removed, which means these steps are placement of charge objects, adding, separation, and removal of charge body. Why to charge two bodies by contact? To charge two bodies in contact by induction, you start with inducing the charge, distribution of two opposite charges, separation through short distance while the charge rod is still in position and then charge rod is removed. So these are the things you should know or the summary or the key parts. There are many things we need not go core into. That is why I try to make it as light as possible. Yeah. But if you are studying engineering, electrical or you are going deep in physics, you see more of all this and the core part especially electromagnetism so in the next episode we shall quickly look at electric field the formulas you need to know flow intensity then next two episodes we look at calculations 
So let's see what comes in. Remember, what goes around comes around. And don't forget to get the Flash Finance application right now on your stores and begin to play with questions and features. So chat me up on WhatsApp if you have anything to tell me or if you have questions or queries about the application. So see you in the next episode. Take care of yourself.